Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for the second online edition of our Human Dimensions Workshop. My name is Rima Jabado, and I'm the chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Shark Specialist Group. It's a welcome to welcome you uh, here for this four day event. So the first webinar that was organized in summer 2021 was a crash course in the human dimensions of shark conservation. It was really well attended and we received great feedback from around the world. Those of you that work in shark, ray and chimera conservation on the ground know that we simply can't conserve these species without considering the impact that any conservation measures may have on fishery stakeholders. From the fishers themselves, the marketers, often women in many parts of the world, and the traders at the local scale. So of course, the multitude of other stakeholders once the products leave a landing site or the country are also important. So it's really critical to consider these human dimensions if we want any of our actions to be meaningful and effective. And that's really the point of this week, trying to expose some of the work that has been done to understand the social dimension of shark conservation with real life examples from around the world. So I want to start by thanking Divya Karnad and Holly Booth, the co-chairs of the Shark Specialist Group Human Dimensions Working Group that have organized this event. It's a great initiative and I'm grateful to them for taking the lead on this. I want to also thank Paula Dominguez, who's been volunteering with the group for over a year now and has been instrumental in making sure this webinar can actually take place. But also a huge thank you to the Shark Trust and Hetty Brown for allowing us to use this platform to host the event and helping us organize it. And of course, to all of the speakers today and this week who have been generous with their time and are sharing their knowledge and experience with us, this would not be possible without them. We'd like to make this event available for those that could not join us, and we are therefore recording it. I hope that all participants are comfortable with this, but please let us know if you have any concerns. Uh, before we start the event, I'd like to give Divya the opportunity to go through some house housekeeping. So Divya, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Rima, and welcome uh, to our hundreds of participants who've signed up. Thank you so much. Um, so just to start with a little bit of housekeeping, for the next two days, we will retain this start time. Uh, but on the last day, that is the 8th of June, we will be starting one hour later. So on the last day, the 8th of June, we will delay the start by one hour. Um, and so the first three days will follow this format of a panel uh, followed by a Q&A. Uh, each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we will bombard you with a few polls because we want to ensure that all of you have been listening carefully and um, also to make sure that you know things don't get too monotonous. Um, on the fourth day, we will have breakout rooms or parallel sessions uh, where you can interact with the panelists uh, of each day. Uh, and so you, it'll be a kind of meet and greet and interactive session, and I uh, highly recommend that you attend these. Uh, please make sure that you put your questions into the chat box uh, whenever they occur to you, and we'll try and address them either at the end of the session each day or um, at the end uh, on the last day of the workshop. Um, so please do remember to participate in the polls. And um, also, we are happy to take feedback at the end of each day uh, via email. So please uh, do that. Um, I just like to reiterate all the gratitude uh, for all the people that Rima mentioned. Um, because really, without, without all of you, without the speakers, without the Shark Trust, uh, and especially without Paula, I don't think any of this would have got done. Uh, so having said that, back to you, Rima. thanks. Thank you, Divya. So um, we've got, like Divya said, we have three days lined up to discuss first the trade in species and their various der der derivative products, so today. Tomorrow we'll focus on how local ecological knowledge can be gathered and used to inform policy. On Wednesday, we will explore how citizen science contributions can help us understand species biology and ecology. 
And finally, on Thursday, there will be this additional opportunity for everyone to discuss these topics and network. So um, the program, again, was developed based on an overview of some of the current publications that are focused on human dimensions of shark, ray, and chimera fisheries. So I hope you all enjoy it. Um, we have three speakers for today. The first one is Dr. Anna Martins. Anna is a postdoctoral researcher at Dalhousie University who has been studying the shark meat trade. In her home country of Brazil, she used angler knowledge to uncover trends in the shark meat trade. Unfortunately, she can't join us live for the Q&A, but we have her presentation that will be um, streamed. Um, the second presentation will be by Dr. Claire Collins, who is a postdoctoral researcher with the Zoological Society of London and University of Exeter. Her work focuses on understanding human dimensions of socio-ecological systems with previous work that has included a focus on the social importance of shark fisheries, drivers of fisher spatial behavior, and understanding perceptions of conservation and management policies to make sure that their effectiveness can be improved. And finally, Dr. Holly Booth. Holly, so again, uh, along with being an organizer of this event as co-chair of the Human Dimensions Working Group, is also an applied researcher and conservation practitioner who specializes in the application of mitigation hierarchy principles and market-based approaches to design nature recovery strategies and projects. She's worked as a technical advisor for the Wildlife Conservation Society, where she's helped to develop and implement various marine conservation strategies for sharks and rays. And she's now working as a senior specialist with the Biodiversity Consultancy. So over to you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Ana Barbosa Martins. I'm a postdoc at Dalhousie University in Canada, and I work on a project called Uncovering the Global Shark Meat Trade. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about this project, and I'm going to try to explain to you how we aim to estimate the volume and the composition of the global shark meat trade. So sharks and rays have been caught since the beginning of civilization. They are an important fishery resource um, and they've been caught for many reasons as they have and they provide several byproducts and this can include fins, liver, uh, skin and teeth. But we know they're mostly caught and have been caught because of their meat. Uh, the shark meat is an important um, protein source um, it's important for food and nutritional security in many coastal communities, uh, but it's also a source of income for a range of stakeholders. So even though it might sound weird um, still uh, to many people, um, shark and ray meat are consumed uh, in most of the coastal countries, and uh, some regions even have specific dishes made of shark and ray meat that are part of their culture, or they're part of their traditions. But unfortunately, um, despite being quite common um, in terms of trade and consumption, understanding shark meat markets, it's not something very simple, um, especially when compared with other markets such as the fin market and the fin trade, um, there's very little information about the, the shark meat trade. There are not many studies out there. There are not many databases providing all the information that we need. And um, the markets are very complex as they are widespread, they are diverse. Um, the routes are completely intricate and difficult to follow. Um, but we do know uh, as we follow the, the increasing demand for seafood that this market has been um, increasing the demand for shark meat has been increasing. So when we look at uh, the shark meat trade, there are three main issues that stand out. First of all, we know that global land is decreasing. Um, and this unfortunately is not a result of conservation measures, it is a result of populations being in decline. We are overfishing our shark and rib population, so it's much harder uh, for fishers to catch the same amounts that they used to catch in the past. Second, uh, we are seeing an, uh, an expansion in markets um, and uh, this could be a result of many things. It could be a result of finger attached policies creating a new market for meat for the sharks that now have to be brought uh, to, to, to the ports. 
um, there is also an overall demand and increase in demand for seafood in general and there is a decline in um, more important fishery resources such as tuna, cod, mackerel and so many other things so all of the things combined um, with more or less impact depending on the region uh, may have helped to create um, um, not to create but to expand uh, markets for shark meat and the main issue coming out of that is that we do not have much information about it uh, sadly we don't know how much um, of shark and rays have actually been caught and traded and we have even less information on the species composition of this trade and that's why we we have this project, um, the Uncover in the Global Shark Meat Trade. We have several objectives and goals, but overall, uh, we want to compile everything that is available um, in the literature or in databases uh, or reports or whatever um, on shark landing trade and consumption. Um, so we can generate estimates of those aspects for each country and as well as species. So the idea is with all the information we hand in hand, we can develop a matrix of global shark meat trade. And with this matrix, um, in collaboration with uh, many other researchers around the globe, uh, we want to provide information uh, that, you, that could be useful um, for policy makers um, and for researchers to, to have a better understanding of the shark meat trade in their particular region and also to inform um, uh, policy makers and, and managers um, and people that are working towards shark and ray conservation. So this project has a global scope and we work in collaboration with several researchers from different parts of the world. Um, the countries highlighted in green, uh, the places we have collaborators and they help us um, to collect information through fisheries um, statistics national databases from the literature but just data from their own research or their network of, of collaborators as well so they provide us with the information that it's already available um, and easily accessible the countries in maroon uh, brown or reddish uh, those are the countries that are extremely important to the global um, shark meat trade but that we couldn't uh, have access um, or the countries just didn't have much information on fisheries statistics um, or the global shark meat uh, trade in general. So in these countries, we have been developing market surveys um, to help us to have a better understanding of the trade, of the blendings and the trade of sharks and rays in these areas. But how do we do that? How do we try to estimate volumes and species composition? Well, so in a simplified way, uh, we have here, um, we start by collecting uh, information on fisheries, um, statistics and landings. Um, so as I said, some countries will have their this information easily accessible, um, some countries will not. So to have access to information, either we go through uh, national level statistics or we, you know, gather information from our collaborators or we perform market surveys. On top of that, uh, we have a team of specialists from each country uh, who also help us to make sense of, the, of what we find in terms of fishery statistics or uh, what we're finding in the market surveys. These experts are people that have been working in these countries for decades and have an understanding uh, of the, the, the fisheries in the area and can provide us uh, with precise and, and information about uh, the landings in each particular region. We use that information from fisheries, from the landing, um, to, to help us to understand the trade as well by matching um, fisheries information, landing data with uh, trade data and we try to match up um, the numbers and values uh, and whatever it's um, landed but not traded um, we also include that into our consumption estimates so combining all those informations about lendings um, 
coming through fisheries as statistics or to market surveys or through uh, expert opinion. Uh, with trade databases and consumption information, we put this all together into a statistical model. And um, by doing this, then we hope to have um, this um, more detailed estimates of imports, exports, and consumption by country and by species. So I have here one example, a uh, very simple, uh, simplified example of, of the type of information that we're dealing with. Um, so let's say we have a given country A, and we know the country A is exporting a certain amount of shark meat to country B. What do we know, what do we have uh, about country A? So we know the country A has about 160 shark and ray species. We know uh, that 12 of those species are highly important for the fisheries in this particular country. And we also know uh, that species X has the highest probability of being traded because it's the most important uh, species for the shark and ray fisheries in country A. How do we know that? We can know this through the literature, uh, through national statistics, through information provided by our experts. We can know this through uh, market surveys. There are many ways um, that we can uh, gather this information for country A um, in order to have this little summary, uh, this little characterization of the country. And then we have country B which we know that has about 12 shark and ray species. Um, we know there is a country that imports shark meat from many others. So we have here uh, from 25 countries, 26 countries that have been uh, exporting um, shark meat to country B. And we know, um, and this here could be through our market surveys, for example, that species X is highly preferred in country B. So this is the kind of information that we're working with. Um, and then that's when we start stitching things together. And, the, and, and how we stitch things together is by using our statistical models. So um, with our statistical models, we can start to make predictions based on the information that we have. So knowing that country A uh, catches um, and landed, it's landing uh, quite a lot of species X um, and knowing that country A has exported, has a history of exporting uh, to country B, and also knowing that country B has a preference for species X, we can start making predictions that, hey, it's very likely that country A is exporting species X to country B, because that's what they like, and that's what country A has. So these assumptions uh, and these connections um, start to be made, um, start to be made with uh, the information that we have from the data as well as from our experts and our market surveys, but it's put together in a probabilistic way through our statistical models. So this is a very simplified example, but it's pretty much uh, how we've been working um, with this information. So in, in summary, what we actually want to do is to gather this very genetic information that we can find on global databases about um, sharks and rays uh, being exported as a meat, as a meat product. Um, actually look at that and say like, hey, this is actually a, a, a trade between country A and country B and what is actually included in this trade, it's 50% of species X and 25% of species Y, and so and so on. So overall, um, our methodology is it's basically lots of data collection, lots of collaboration, uh, and expert opinion, and, and, and getting information from people that already have done the work, um, and also using statistical models to stitch everything together. Uh, and give us results in terms of probabilities. So we hope that uh, by the end of this project, which will probably be uh, early next year or mid next year, um, we'll have a better sense of, of, of the volume of the shark meat trade, of the species composition of the shark meat trade, the country preferences, the main players, the main routes and markets, 
as well as the threatened species. Not just the threatened species by the IUCN, but the species that might not be listed as threatened, but uh, they are the ones that are more affected by the meat trade itself. So before I go, I'd just like to say thank you um, to the fantastic team that has been working on this project. Um, particularly my supervisor Aaron McNeil and my mate Chris Mall, who's the the other the other postdoc in this project, but also the other PIs Beth Babcock, um, Damian Chapman, Luke Bovic, um, and huge shout out to all the students that have been helping us um, to make this project happen. Uh, they've been doing fantastic work. Really proud of them all. And uh, finally, um, a big thank you to our institutions and as well as our founders. So I'll take any questions. Thank you so much for being here again and bye. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm, um, I mean, we had such a great talk by Dr. Rana, and now we move on to Dr. Claire Collins, who will be speaking about uh, Sri Lanka's domestic shark value chains. Uh, so over to Dr. Claire. Hello, my name is Claire Collins, and I'm a postdoc researcher at the Institute of Zoology and also the University of Exeter. And I'm going to speak today about uh, domestic um, value chains for sharks in Sri Lanka. So why are we interested in studying trade within Sri Lanka? So Sri Lanka has um, is one of the countries where there's a strong demand for meat within the domestic market. And we were interested in understanding the importance of that as a non-fin commodity in driving trade. Also, as part of my PhD in a wider project that I was involved in, we were looking at illegal fishing um, of sharks by Sri Lankan vessels landing to the south and west coast. And we wanted to look at shark trade and the relative importance um, of it in terms of how it was driving uh, fishers to travel such long distances and risk arrest in order to catch uh, shark species. It's also recorded one of the strongest line declines in landings globally. So it's unclear as to whether that is due to regulations like increased regulatory coverage or potentially there's been a change in terms of the drivers. So the price for different products or the relative importance of the market. So that is one of the things that we're interested in understanding a little bit more about. So this quote here 
do you know how many people make their livelihood just because of a single shark comes from a trader that we spoke to in the southwest of Sri Lanka and it kind of exemplifies um the thoughts around there's lots of different products and it, it's not clear as to what relative importance those products have and for different people and, and why that's driving fisheries and trade so the aim of this chapter which is my phd is looking at can we just map out the domestic flow and it was um constrained to domestic flow very much and um, which products are going where which kind of uh stakeholders are involved in the value chains and the relative sort of proportional flow of products as well so how much is going between different individuals we're also interested in looking at what are the financial gains so the price for different products the relative importance of different products and who's actually making um sort of money off them um value chains are very much not you know static sort of vertical um entities they're very dynamic and there's lots of different important things that will affect them such as you know relationships between individuals the wider policy and regulatory framework um sort of social norms and cultural norms as well so understanding all of those different aspects is really key and understanding why a value chain is the way it is and we were un interested in understanding a bit more just about this broader socioeconomic context so we were constrained to the south and west coast of Sri Lanka. And the reason that we did that was because uh, from a targeted literature review and speaking to researchers, that's seen as very much sort of a hub for shark trade. So um, there's sort of central markets or processing sites that um, deal with a relatively large proportion of the sharks that get landed to Sri Lanka. It's also the location of some of uh, sort of the busiest harbours for the pelagic um, for the high seas going fleet. So that is targeted um, shark fishing vessels, but also those that catch um, sharks as bycatch as well. And um, there's a lot of them landing to the two sites that we we're at on the south and west coast. So it tends to be associated with much higher um, sort of landings of pelagic sharks in particular. And the tools that we used to do this is we used um, market surveys, so recorded sales in landing sites and also sort of open markets and retail shops, processing sites, etc. And we did that over a year. And in total, we did 31 survey days um, over mostly these two locations. But we also spent a couple of days in the capital trying to get a bit of context for price in terms of the larger wholesale markets there. And um, we did... 630 sales in total however these represent um a whole spectrum of um sort of weight so that can range from one shark from being sold from one vessel to a trader to like really big sales of like 100 150 um sharks between a trader and processor for example so the different types of factors that we wanted to record in order to understand value chains were who's selling who's buying which kind of livelihood role were they in What's the product type? So dried shark meat makes up a relatively large proportion of the market, um, especially for like domestic consumption. So um, when, at which point does that happen and, and how does that impact on price and flow, et cetera? So whether it was dried or fresh, whether it was in chunks or whole shark, um, was it fins attached, fins not attached? Um, price that was being paid. So who was paying um, what? And then what were they going to sell it as? And sometimes that relied on estimates, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, who was doing what processing and at which points in the value chain and uh, weights as well. So overall sort of size of the uh, sales to try and get that proportional flow. We wanted to contextualise that with um, sort of broader understanding about the context of you know the socioeconomics of value chain so we ended up doing 24 interviews with stakeholders that um we identified as key within value chain so traders processors vendors and exporters and we recruited those through snowball sampling so um asking people to um provide contacts for sort of onward interviews after we'd interviewed them so i think I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what are sort of the considerations and why shark trade research might be particularly difficult at points. Um, so obviously species ID is very complicated with the and products in general, but um, this can be further complicated by, you know, removal of characteristic features such as fins and degradation. So some of the sharks that we were dealing with had been in holds for sort of up to two months or something. So you've got discoloration and, and sort of other um, sort of issues that prevent you from understanding what species it is. Um, and also it wasn't possible to sort of um, 
measure how large the sharks were if you've got really large sales and also people were hesitant to let us do any sort of like biological sampling on sharks so what we did in order to get around these issues is we were like led by the stakeholders so sort of trader led so we'd ask them what are you selling this as um are you selling it as a milk shark are you selling it as blue um various different other categories that are commonly used and what sort of shark um size category are you selling at is it small is it medium um that sort of thing and in, in that way we got an understanding about what categories might be driving prices as opposed to sort of um using our own determinants of you know different species etc um Following the transfer of value across value chains was also quite difficult because we were reliant on these estimates. So because of the preponderance of dried um, shark meat, it might be that people store it for sort of one, two months or something like that, even um, from drying and then selling it. So they weren't sure, exactly sure as to how much they were going to sell it for. So we often had to ask for estimates. Um, and a lot of this relied on, you know, really good relationship with traders, especially because we had silent auctions within our value chains. So we relied on um, being able to speak to people post-sale and understand how much they'd ended up paying for things. Uh, for the interviews, um, we needed to map the initial supply chains before we thought about who we needed to speak to and through that we identified eight value chain roles but these were highly dynamic in terms of people engaging in more than multiple activities but also the the actual sort of definition or description of what these roles were was slightly different depending on who you were speaking to um and these are some of the most sensitive issues that we actually came across was asking in terms of like livelihoods um you know overall earnings people were quite reluctant to or just couldn't because of the fact that it fluctuated so much so we did encounter some difficulties with with understanding shark sort of role within livelihoods so we were able to map out all the potential links between different stakeholders and we were able to get weight data for 69 percent of sales and that allowed us to create this sort of proportional diagram which is which is here um as to what is the relative flow. Um, so as you can see, it mostly sort of follows a typical pattern, you know, auction trader process, a wholesaler, and then onwards. But these sort of smaller, darker arrows also indicate um, some, you know, some links that um, are less common. So potentially an auctioneer might sell it directly to a retailer. So smaller scale retailers might come and just buy a whole landed shark and then process it afterwards. Um, but they tend to follow a typical pattern but um yeah understanding sort of proportional flow was something that was quite difficult especially when it came to um sharks being imported so there is import of uh, dried sharks um, especially so from places like indonesia and it was really difficult to quantify that because retailers could found it difficult to tell us exactly how much they bought because it fluctuated so much depending on like domestic landings availability and domestic demand as well so that's one thing that um, it would be good to research a bit more looking at sort of what are the financial gains the price of landed sharks so this is landed sharks with uh fins on gutted um the, from fishers to traders um that varied from like half a dollar up to five dollars um, with a median around two and a half. Um, and we did find that um, sort of vertical distribution of financial gains was quite um, severe so that people at the top, obviously, traders, um, sorry, exporters and were making a lot more money because they were dealing with, you know, sort of a finalised fin products for export. Um, and interestingly, fish is almost all of the time sold sharks with fins on um, and they understood that um there wasn't much price between a landed shark with a fin on and shark meat itself per kg there wasn't much difference and fishers understood that if they they did separate them and sell the fin separately they might be able to get um higher sort of financial gains however it was just sort of an accepted um sort of social norm i guess within the value chains that that was the role of traders because they had the context or that was sort of how they made their money um but it was difficult to get exact prices and incomes because there was such fluctuations um in daily earnings just because the supply of sharks varies so much depending on you know season or when some of the larger shark vessels were landing so we were interested in understanding like what actually 
drives a specific price point for shark products. So we ended up doing analysis on landed sharks with fins attached and gutted. Um, and we used interviews and sort of informal conversations at markets to understand a little bit more about which different types of factors might be driving that ultimate price. Um, and we came up with, you know, species, size of the shark, so size category, location of the sale itself, which port it was at, um, and also overall landing. So how much the supply was at that time um and we did some modeling with that and only species actually had a significant relationship with price um and unfortunately for species we needed to use a binary proxy variable which is whether or not it was sold as blue shark or not just because it was so difficult to id a lot of the species um and um there was also a lot of sort of wider factors that we think are important for into such as quality of sharks and uh, macroeconomics in terms of wider international price for fins and sort of key political events such as covid which happened during the study um but we weren't able to include sort of that as a proxy variable so you know more research on that would help to understand a little bit more about um you know what is most significant in driving these prices so in terms of livelihood sharks were the primary income source for the most of the 24 stakeholders that we spoke to um, and there were highly specialised roles such as liver oil processing, and a lot of those had no alternative incomes. One of the difficult things in determining how important sharks are for, you know, however many people was the presence of temporary work throughout value chains. So this speaks to a lot of the fluctuations in terms of landings. Again, the fact that there are some really um, sort of substantial landings from specific vessels. Um, it means that lots of sort of fish cutters or fish processors, um, they'll just be employed on a temporary basis. So it's difficult to quantify, you know, how many people are actually sort of earning money either on a temporary or permanent basis through shark trade. Um, one of the interesting things was that um, a lot of people said to us that shark prices and related to that shark trade was a relatively stable earnings because the fact that the price didn't fluctuate as much as other fish species. And they said that that could be due to the prevalence of dried um, shark meat so people could store it and, and wait for a better price um, and it was kind of relied upon then you know during COVID it just didn't fluctuate anywhere near as much as price for other um, fish species and um, we were interested in looking at how do people actually get access to these livelihood roles and um, a lot of people said that because of you know dried shark meat it was easier to start trading sharks because you didn't need to have you know advanced refrigeration and um, so you didn't need to make much investment if you wanted to start trading sharks and we also found that social relationships is you know are very important in determining some the nature of some transactions so the price for which shark goes is you know reliant on those relationships but also that some sort of smaller scale um sellers that would just um sort of sell on a daily basis and buy on the day and sell on the day they were getting given shark for like some in some cases for free or for a really um low price because um other people in the value chains identified them as being in sort of socioeconomic hardship and they said that they used sharks to sort of give to those um sort of individuals as opposed to other fish species Thinking about, you know, increased regulatory coverage and sort of species specific policies, um, ID was difficult with the market surveys, but we did find that it was a, you know, mostly made up of blues and silkies um, and thinking about um, increased attention on silky shark populations and potentially increased regulations. Um, silky sharks, um, you know, the removal of sort of the ability to catch or trade silky sharks would have a, a large impact on um, sort of uh stakeholders within within these um Sri Lankan value chains um, and that's also potentially exacerbated by the fact that silky sharks go for more money than blue sharks and that's due to um the sort of uh price of their fins so blue shark fins we found were not very uh, desirable because of their sort of uh, texture so if silky sharks were taken it might have um you know not only take out the sort of volume but also have a proportionally larger impact than if other sort of less valuable species were taken out uh thinking about um sort of things that um went wrong or you know stuff that we could learn from throughout our data set you know suffered from gaps in terms of you know price weight um you know livelihoods and stuff and it it is part in partly driven to complications the fact that so you know there is 
some illegal trade and that is also highly sensitive data as well such as earnings so it does complicate it somewhat when trying to um, understand everything about shark trade and we were also relatively limited to the south and west coast so it'd be interesting to see more about um sort of different types of shark species that are landed um around Sri Lanka as well as the ones that we were looking at which is mostly pelagic on the south and west coasts but why do you trade studies and, and what could this trade study potentially tell us so um, thinking about increased policies or management and, and trying to predict the impact of that on um, livelihoods and um, having data at species specific and product specific level is incredibly important. So, you know, as we'd seen as well, there were specific sort of drivers and different factors to consider for different products for sharks in Sri Lanka. And um, so, for example, if you're thinking about like a ban on fins or something like that, um, you need that product specific data in order to separate out um what impact it would have um just you know how much earnings people get from meat versus how much is it from fins who would it impact which stakeholders would it impact and then also thinking about species specific or you know like similar to we do like product um sort of category specific what impact would a ban on like threshers or sort of silky sharks have on shark fishes how much of the sort of drivers for fisheries is that going to remove um by taking um sort of out those species so that's why it's so important to have this sort of granularity in data um, because we can predict policies, uh, policy impact a lot more. So thank you to all of the research team that are with us and um, my sponsors as well, my funders, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Claire, for a very interesting and insightful presentation on the situation in Sri Lanka. The next presentation is from Holly Booth about understanding local drivers of shark exploitation to design effective interventions. Hi, everyone. My name is Holly Booth, and as part of this IUCN Shark Specialist Group Human Dimensions Working Group series, I'm going to be talking about understanding local drivers of shark exploitation to design effective interventions. Now, because of the nature of this group, I don't think I really need to give any background on um, the state of sharks and the threats that they face. But I think one really important bit of background context is that shark conservation requires us to understand and manage trade-offs. So if we want to save sharks, and we want to reduce overfishing of sharks. Um, this requires sets of rules and changes in certain people's behavior. Um, and it requires that somebody um, loses out um, at least somewhere in the short term. Um, and this results in these kind of trade-offs between the existence and non-consumptive values of sharks, um, for example, through tourism, um, and, and this promotes sort of long-term population health versus the sort of consumptive use values of sharks um, in terms of the short-term needs of local communities. And of course, we can argue that if overfishing is reduced now, then populations will be healthier in the longer term for, for fishing and it will stop um, populations from becoming locally extinct completely. Um, and we can also argue that, for example, Sharks are worth more alive through tourism than they are through fishing. Um, but the real question is, 
um, who benefits and and when. And perhaps they are worth more alive on a kind of broad economic scale, but to whom? Um, who gets these benefits? Um, and so within this context, uh, the big research question that I'm interested in is how do we address unsustainable fishing and trade of shark and red products whilst maintaining or improving the well-being of coastal communities who depend on this trade? Um, and this is in part because typically uh, coastal communities and small-scale fishers often tend to bear the brunt of the costs of shark and ray conservation while not necessarily receiving uh, many of the benefits, at least in the short term. So how can we manage these trade-offs? And I'm going to talk about this um, in the context of a specific case study in a place called Aceh Jaya in Aceh province, Indonesia. So why Indonesia? Well, Indonesia is a global priority for answering this question. It's the epicenter of the coral triangle, which is a global hotspot for species diversity and endemicity. Um, it's also got more around 18,000 islands and 55,000 kilometers of coastline. So um, it's an enormous country for which the ocean is very important. It's the world's second largest fish producer and the world's largest shark fishing nation. However, around 99% of the fisheries are small scale. And Indonesia is rapidly developing. However, around 14% of the population are still experiencing multidimensional poverty. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, sort of poverty and well-being of coastal communities is still a really important issue in Indonesia. Now, zooming in to the case study in Aceh. So Aceh province is the westernmost province of Indonesia. And Aceh Jaya is just on the, the southwest coast of Aceh. Um, it's, it's a beautiful place and there's this um, huge bit of um, coastline, which is critical habitat for hammerhead sharks and wedgefish. Um, and dotted all along this coastline are a bunch of small scale fisheries, which go out almost every day, um, catching a variety of fish to meet people's daily needs. And, um, because the wedgefish and the hammerheads hang out where the fish hang out, fishers often come back with uh, wedgefish and hammerhead sharks in their nets, um, which um, are used for uh, both local consumption and sometimes um, traded on to bigger cities. And so we wanted to understand the sort of local level drivers of this fishing and trade um, so that we could design approaches that could help to reduce overfishing and trade of these critically endangered species. And I'm going to talk you through a little bit of a sort of journey from research to action. So uh, the first step that we took was to try to understand drivers and constraints through baseline research. We then conducted more partic participatory research to try to design solutions. And we're now currently trialing solutions in the real world through a pilot intervention. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about next steps in terms of learning, adapting and scaling. So part one, understanding drivers and constraints. So first of all, we used something called the theory of planned behavior, which is an approach from social psychology, which aims to understand people's salient beliefs regarding different behaviors. And we essentially surveyed fishers and local traders in this community to understand their salient beliefs regarding catching wedgefish, hammerheads, and whale sharks. And essentially the main takeaway from this is that in, in the cases where it's overwhelmingly green, when the color is mostly green, that means that people's beliefs were mostly positive. And in the case where it is orange, that means that people's beliefs were mostly negative. And so when we ask people about their beliefs regarding catching wedgefish and hammerheads, they were overwhelmingly positive. So um, a, a term that was often used was the term rejeki, which means gift or gift from the ocean. And people often said things like, which means it can be sold or it can be eaten. So people are happy to catch wedgefish and head sharks and the sort of the reasons for these are that they can be sold and eaten. In contrast, interestingly, we found that there were overwhelmingly negative beliefs regarding catching whale sharks. And many people use the term diabawa uh, ikan kachil or diabawa rujeki because they believe that whale sharks are important for local ecosystem and that they have to bring the small fish. So people actually don't want to catch whale sharks. 
In contrast, we then asked people what they thought about potentially releasing these taxa or not catching and trading them. And as you can see, the colours kind of switch. Um, and so for waitress and hammerhead sharks, beliefs were overwhelmingly negative. And for wild sharks, beliefs were overwhelmingly positive. So people often use the term mubazir for uh, releasing waitress and hammerhead sharks, which means um, wasteful. And it also actually has religious connotations um, and it kind of implies that um, God will be displeased. So we've received this um, this gift from God, this gift from the ocean, this rejecki, and if we throw it back into the ocean, um, uh, it, it's more bazir, it's wasteful, and God will be displeased. And then in contrast, overwhelmingly positive beliefs regarding releasing wild sharks, again, because as mentioned previously, deal bawa rejecki or deal bawa ikka kachil, they're important for the ecosystem, so people are happy to release wild sharks. So the, the key conclusion from, from this stage in the research is that while waitress and hammerhead sharks aren't the main target for these gillnet fishers in Ashley Jaya, they do have value in local trade because they can be sold and they can be eaten. So what does this mean in terms of management approaches? So next, we took this information to try to design solutions with fishers. So we used something called scenario interviews with contingent valuation to ask fishers if or how they would reduce landings of wedgefish and hammerheads under four hypothetical future scenarios. So the first scenario was just business as usual. Imagine that nothing changes at all, everything stays the same. And most fishers said they wouldn't change or would potentially increase their catches of these critically endangered taxa. We then asked fishers, what if there was um, an, an externally imposed rule by the government, for example, with a fine imposed if you catch and trade these species? And actually, as you can see, many fishers said they wouldn't change their behavior. And the reason was that they just said they wouldn't comply because they thought it, it wasn't fair. So, okay, these taxa do have local trade value, but they, they just come to the net, they just hang out with the other fish hang out, and it's not fair if we're going to be punished if we catch and trade them. We then asked fishers what if they could volunteer to release these species. So they could just agree, they could sign a voluntary agreement and, and agree to not catch and to trade them anymore. And actually many fishers said they were willing to voluntarily release these species and especially small wedge fish. And then finally, we asked fishers, what if you were compensated for the value that you could otherwise solve these species for? And 100% of fishers said they would be willing to reduce their landings and local trade if they were compensated for the lost income. And actually, the amount of money that fishers expected to be compensated is very small. So it was around $1 to $3 per individual hammerhead and around $4 to $7 per individual wedgefish. So what did we do next? We then presented these results back to stakeholders and we established voluntary agreements to compensate fishers if they safely release wedgefish and hammerhead sharks. And we've implemented the scheme across um, 38 vessels in Ashajaya as a randomized control trial with randomization at the vessel level using a rotation design. And here are some of the results. And we've been running the trial now for almost exactly a year. And um, actually, this says 500 wedgefish and hammerheads released safely this past year. But I just got a report in earlier today of even more released this past week. And we're now, I think, up to at least 600 individual wedgefish and hammerhead sharks that have been um, safely released uh, this past year that would have otherwise been sold and or eaten in Atiyah.
And we're collecting data on uh, the impact of the intervention in terms of fishers' um, attitudes, behavior, and actual conservation outcomes. And so you can see here, this diagram shows fishers' attitudes towards uh, releasing these species. And um, it shows that uh, fishers who are in the trial, who are receiving the compensatory payments, report a higher willingness to release wedgefish relative to before the trial and relative to control fishers who are not currently receiving the compensate to release payments. And then if we do some statistics on the landings data, um, this shows a coefficient plot of the likelihood of landing zero wedgefish. Um, this plots are a little bit confusing to understand, so just let me explain. Um, if you sort of go to the right, it shows increasing odds of zero wedgefish being landed, and um, to the left shows decreasing odds of zero wedgefish being landed. And we can see um, that the bottom there shows the, the treatment effect, um, and we found that um, having the compensate to release treatment significantly increases the likelihood that zero wedgefish are landed by about 60%. Um, and you can also see that there's an increasing odds of zero being landed during the wet season and also in one of the villages in Ache Jaya. And then finally, this diagram shows box plots of fishers subjective well-being. Um, and we found that uh, fishers who were in the trial report no significant differences in subjective well-being compared to before and control fishers. And this is a good thing. Because one, what we wanted to try to achieve is conservation outcomes for these critically endangered species while maintaining or improving the well-being of these fishes. And so we've we've delivered conservation outcomes. We've had massive reductions in the in the landings of these species and and um, all of these live releases. And yet, um, fishers reported well-being has remained the same. Um, so we've managed to kind of avoid these negative trade-offs and negative impacts on fishers. So that's great. And then in terms of the next steps, so um, we actually have students in the field as we speak who are doing um, sort of end of trial interviews with both um, fishers, local traders and uh, female heads of household to um, understand their perceptions of the trial um, and to potentially figure out ways of extending it or, um, or improving it. We're also now starting to look at long term sustainable financing um, and we've conducted some other work, for example, looking at tourists. Uh, local dive tourists' willingness to pay towards um, community-based conservation, which could provide a long-term funding source. And we're now also thinking about um, expanding the approach to other places. So using sort of a similar process and similar surveys to um, understand bycatch of other endangered shark and rare species in different villages and see if we can design similar incentive-based approaches that are adapted to local context. So overall, what are the lessons learned? So trade-offs are everywhere and we need to acknowledge and understand them and find ways to ensure that the world's poorest people do not bear the majority of the costs of shark conservation. The drivers of shark trade are complex with interactions between supply-driven and demand-driven local international markets and economics and culture. And we need to understand drivers and constraints so that we can intervene appropriately. So in the context of Ache, um, we find that it's kind of a combination of, you know, the fact that it's bycatch, it's just there, but also um, sort of local drivers of trade. So people eat the meat locally. Um, and occasionally if they get a big wedge fish, um, the fin is, is sold on into the international trade. Um, but there's sort of these complex interactions between supply and demand in, in this case, um, in terms of in terms of shark mortality. Um, and also, you know, it's not just about money, but also the fact that, um, for example, people consume hammerheads in, in shark curry locally. Um, so we need to understand all these different different factors. Um, and, you know, if, if the international shark fin trade disappeared tomorrow, it actually probably wouldn't make much difference in terms of um, shark mortality in this particular village. Conservation is fundamentally about people and the choices they make, and we must include the people who will be most effective when designing interventions to conserve and restore resilient marine ecosystems and to um, mitigate trade in endangered species. 
the real world is complex and dynamic and sometimes conservation can feel like whack-a-mole um you know things change so we need robust impact assessments and adaptive management so that we can make sure that what we're doing is actually working um, and then if the situation changes we can adapt appropriately and there are no silver bullet solutions i think that we need sort of shared outcome-based goals and by that i mean um you know, we all want healthy shark populations. That is the end outcome goal. And then we need scaling of participatory methods and processes to figure out what's the best way to get towards that goal in a given context, rather than trying to impose one size fits all solutions across different places and contexts. So um, that's all from me today. Uh, just a quick um, rundown of some of the various papers that I've um, cited in this presentation. And a huge shout out to all of my um, students, collaborators, um, mentors, um, all of the fishers who, who've been involved in this work um, over the past years and funders as well. Um, and yeah, if you if you want to get in touch, um, you can follow me on Twitter at Holly Boothy and you can follow the Instagram page for our um, uh, Hammerhead and Whitefish Release Program, um, which is uh, at um, and if you want to find any more about my PhD research, you can check out the link um, that's on my Twitter profile as well. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Holly, for that. That was um, really interesting and, again, insightful in terms of what's happening. I think all of us um, often get stuck with thinking that uh, the shark fin trade is the primary problem for sharks and rays and the primary driver. It still is, but the trade has become so dynamic in the last decade in particular. And um, obviously we can see that the meat trade is becoming something increasingly complex to understand and try and tackle. Uh, in many of the largest fisheries in the world. So um, thank you for, for giving us an overview of uh, some of the things that can be done to approach this. Um, we have uh, Claire on the call. If anybody wants to ask her questions directly, you can um, put them in the comment box. I note that there was an initial comment about whether the presentations will be made available. Divya responded to that. And so uh, all of the presentations will be available on the Hopin app, but also on the Shark Specialist Group YouTube channel. And they'll be there um, for a long time. <laughs> but um, does anyone have any questions for Claire or Divya? Do you want to say something as well? Um. 
Yeah, I guess uh, right now we have some questions that are uh, either for Anna or Holly. But Claire, I was wondering if you wanted to kind of step in and talk about, um, you know, the question that Marcelo asked. Uh, about whether it's worth approaching fishers or whether it makes more sense to approach the fisheries department or the government uh, to get data on uh, things like shark, the shark meat trade. Um, I'm just having a read now. So, um, so yes, I think, I guess, um, a lot of I imagine Holly's and Anna's studies as well started with having a look at what data is there. So having a look at like the government data, which is reported to the FAO. But I guess one of the reasons why it is sort of um, good to do studies such as this, so speaking to the fishers and speaking to um, other stakeholders involved is because there is a lot of gaps in terms of that data. So you'll end up with... Um, lots of sort of different species reported to the same species categories so it's quite hard to understand the species specific trade um, and also a lot of the data is often extrapolated um, quite heavily as well so it might be only a couple of days out of the month in individual ports and then that gets sort of extrapolated so it might miss um, a lot of the sort of nuances within the trade so I think it is really important to work with that data but i think speaking to fishers and other stakeholders is really valuable and um, because you're also going to fill in a lot of the wider sort of social context as well and um, you know not just sort of what's been landed but sort of why and price data and everything like that which is important for understanding trade i think um thank you claire and i Again, I feel the same way in many of the countries that I work in, in, in Africa and in Asia, where um, the governments simply don't have a fisheries monitoring program that, in, that includes sharks and rays. And if they do, if it's often not to the species level. And so it's really important to be able to work with the local fishermen, with the traders and NGOs that are on the ground that may be able to have that um, capacity to collect the data or have them trained to collect the data so that you can really get a better understanding of, of what's happening. So I think that has, at least in my work, been um, part of the reason why we, we support governments with data sharing rather than get the data directly from the governments to begin with. Sure. Thanks, Rima, and thanks, Claire. I think... Um, We'll have the, the responses from the other speakers uh, in on Thursday. And so we can discuss this uh, a little bit more. Um, the next thing that I'd like to do is to actually go back to the polls that we had uh, all of you participate in. Um, and uh, the first thing that we asked is about how you think about the word trade uh, in Elasmo Branks or uh, Sharks, Rays and Chimeras. Um, and it seemed like the majority of people use the word trade to refer to international transactions, um, while uh, relative minorities, uh, you know, about a third of people just thought about it as local consumption versus only fins and gills. Um, and we have this up on the screen now for everyone to see. Uh, and this was something that had confused me for a long time because I thought of any kind of transaction that involves, uh, whether it's domestic or international, uh, to be trade. Uh, and I was wondering if, uh, you know, either Claire or Rima, you wanted to kind of speak uh, to this definition of the word trade. Um. There's definitely international transactions, but uh, regional, I think, is probably something huge and local. There is so much trade in, uh, in parts of Africa that are at the regional level, particularly for the meat. And uh, this is usually completely unreported. It's done by middlemen in trucks crossing borders. Um, and this is extremely important in terms of the, the quantities that uh, are being exported 
and traded regionally, but also increasingly between locally, so nationally between coastal areas and inland areas that may not have access to fish and so on. And so a lot of the shark meat is a cheap source of uh, protein. It is dried or smoked in many countries and then exported to some of the rural communities so that they can have access to um, some of this meat. Claire? Yeah, so I think that's one of the sort of things um, we just focused in on sort of the domestic market because, um, yeah, that trade can be completely missing from statistics if you're just sort of relying on, you know, international um, import-export trade. Um, and so much of what drives fisher fisheries is that domestic trade. Um, it is difficult linking up domestic with international, and I think that's one of the issues around sharks is because there is the different types of products and there's different types of markets trying to put that all together and um, requires a study that is sort of both you know like intensely localized to a certain extent but then also highly international as well if you're going to capture stuff like liver oil fins um, and I think that's one of the things that does drive the complications around understanding shark trade but yeah lo understanding local trade is, is incredibly important for most of the landing countries. Okay, great. And this kind of brings us to the next poll, which is about where uh, a lot of this trade is happening. It seems like a lot of people think it's happening particularly in the global south or in developing countries. Um, whereas perhaps the data shows us that there's much more of the world involved, especially once you include the meat. Um, so uh, again, over to you, Rima and Claire. Uh, absolutely. And I think we often forget the role that Europe, for example, plays in much of the trade for uh, sharks and rays, whether it's the meat or whether it's other products like the skins or the liver oil. So um, I think the trade is very common from in terms of exporting from uh, the global south, but much of it is also going to the to Europe and, and Asia and many of these countries that I don't like the word developed, but developed countries, let's say, of uh, the northern countries. And, and this is where a lot of the demands for various products come from. Yeah, I definitely think it's about the whole picture. Um, I agree, because a lot of the drivers for some fisheries are, you know, exclusively coming from sort of for like cosmetic trade, you know, for liver oil or something like that. And a lot of that... Um, yeah, sort of located we found sort of deep shark fisheries that were just entirely um driven by that demand for liver oil within the cosmetic market um so i think it's all about the the big picture um for them and finally in terms of who we speak to about trade uh, it seems like a lot of people think that we should start with the fishers, which is, of course, uh, where I would think to start, uh, except that uh, in experiences that I have had, it seems like the fishers really don't know much about what's happening. Uh, and they seem to be pretty cut off from um, how, at least in where I work in India, from what happens to the sharks after they are landed. Uh, so they don't know much about the different products. They don't know about the values. They don't seem to know much at all. Uh, and so it seems like we need to, you know, speak to someone else often when we start with the fishers. Um, I was wondering, especially Rima, since you have so much international experience with this, uh, what has been your experience with uh, whom you ask about trade? Thanks, Divya. And, and this speaks to some of the work we've done together in India, obviously, where um, we thought that approaching fishers was the right approach to get a lot of information. But uh, the more we approached fishers in rural communities in areas where education levels were not necessarily very high, we noticed that they actually don't know anything. All they do is they go out and they fish and they can tell us what they're catching, but they have no idea of utilization. They have no idea about trade or prices or, or anything that's really key for us to understand. So it is, um, it's very much context specific and country specific. And obviously fishers in many countries can provide uh, great input about perception of, uh, of 
trends increasing, declining, and so on. But they're not the only ones that need to be approached. Um, traders are very important. Middlemen, uh, the ones that that kind of in many again countries uh, are the ones that go to the landing sites and then take whatever they're catching to the traders. But also women marketers. The women at these landing sites in in India and in Sri Lanka and in many parts of Africa, they're the ones that see everything. They're the ones that are preparing the products before they go to the traders. And so they really have an understanding of what is the demand, what type of utilization processes are in place and how they've changed over time and how much they're selling things. So I think um, depending on the question that you have, you can approach very different types of, um, of, of stakeholders, let's say from the fisher to the middlemen, to the women, to the traders, and eventually to those that um, you know are in the countries where the highest demand is. But um, it's it's really important to understand what question you're asking so that you can determine who the best stakeholders to interview are going to be. Claire, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I'm, I completely agree with that. I think it um, depends on what the specific question is that you're trying to answer. But there is a clear argument for speaking to everyone along the value chain. Um, and I think um, I agree that also sometimes fishers um, might be sort of not have that knowledge in terms of specific like consumer preferences or specific prices for different products as well. So, for example, what we saw in Sri Lanka is that um, the sharks will often be sold with the fins attached, despite the fact that, you know, if they were detached, they could potentially make a lot more money. But it was because there wasn't necessarily they didn't have the connections or it just wasn't sort of part of the social norms to to sell it in that way so they weren't sort of as aware of you know sort of fin prices and and other sort of things that would be driving trade further up the value chain so um it was really valuable for us speaking to people of all different types and we did not speak to consumers and that's something that i think is increasingly important as well because i think in consumption patterns in terms of shark meat especially are changing quite rapidly in a lot of different countries and i think um, it's really interesting to understand a lot more about why that's happening. You know, is it sort of the price of other protein sources is going up? Is it becoming more desirable, etc.? So I think those consumer studies are particularly important at the moment, I think, as well. OK, and uh, we also have questions, uh, especially for you, Claire, uh, about, you know, how you study both the legal but also the illegal practices. Um, and especially in terms of, you know, what is illegal, how effective are the legal regulations uh, and how compliant are local fishers with them? Yes, I think that's an interesting thing. And I think that is something that um, is fairly sort of commonplace when you're doing sort of shark and ray research is that there is going to be sort of elements of illegal behaviours at some point because um, there is uh, regulations and, and that's growing for a lot of different species. And obviously that means that um, you need to build sort of much better relationships with everyone that you're speaking to so that they understand that the intention of trade research is not to sort of identify illegal behaviour. Um, it's actually to understand a little bit more about sort of shark fisheries and and how they the policy can be improved itself. Um, I think that it's interesting because there's different sort of levels of understanding and agreement across value chains as well, because of the fact that some regulations affect others. So, for example, fishers often feel like they are being sort of unfairly targeted to a certain extent by the regulations because um, it is that it's visibly that they're going to get caught for it a lot more than potentially people like market sellers or um, you know, wholesalers or something. So if they're taking the risk to land an illegal species, it's the risk is almost entirely on them um, because it can be concealed once it gets sort of into the wider market. So um, I think that's something that's interesting to think about. You know, fishers are sort of feeling like they're taking most of the risk for this. Um, and is there the awareness and sort of compliance um, you know, what are the attitudes towards compliance further up the value chains as well? Because that is what drives trade as well. And, um, you know, it shouldn't all just be on the fishers to sort of alter their behaviours and, and get fined for these sort of practices. So, um, yeah, I think more research needs to be done across value chains for that sort of thing. 
Um, and uh, a related question that perhaps all of us can think about uh, is whether, you know, a lot of this has been focused on small scale fishers, um, especially, but it seems like some of the biggest uh, issues that are occurring is due to the industrial fisheries. Uh, and it doesn't seem like uh, a lot of at least the published human dimensions work is talking about uh, the industrial fishers. Uh, so uh, is that something that uh, like the human dimensions work has just been avoiding because it's so difficult or, uh, you know, are we going to focus on this as well? Um, so having said this, I want to say that uh, we will be sort of talking about this throughout uh, all the days of the workshop. Uh, but definitely, I think um, in my experience, it's been uh, something that I needed to kind of work up to uh, because it was firstly so much easier to start working with the small scale fishers and then kind of graduate uh, to working with the industrial fishers. It's taken uh, quite some time for me to build trust uh, with some of these uh, industrial fishers and, you know, get accurate information from them. Uh, but have you ever faced these kinds of issues? I think this is a really interesting question. And I disagree that industrial fisheries are actually the ones that have the biggest impact on sharks and rays. Um, the work that I've been doing in many uh, of the countries in the global south actually have hundreds of thousands of small scale fishers that are operating in the coastal waters. And it's increasingly clear that the coastal species are the ones that are really suffering and that we're seeing huge and tremendous declines. And some of the first species that we think are possibly extinct for sharks and rays are the ones that are usually caught in coastal fisheries. Um, having said that, industrial fisheries have had a huge impact on what we call the pelagic species, so about 30 species of sharks and rays that obviously occur in, in, in uh, waters mostly off the continental shelf. Um, and there are, have been huge declines in those species, but it's a limited number of species in a way. And when you're looking at some 50 species, let's say, that are um, impacted directly by industrial fisheries versus over a thousand species that are impacted by small scale fisheries, I think we need to be focusing and talking more about what's happening with small scale fisheries. Um, I'm not saying that regional fisheries management organizations have necessarily been very successful in terms of um, regulating fishing for uh, pelagic species, but there are at least there is progress and increasing progress in terms of what that means for many of the vessels that are considered industrial and that are fishing mostly in, in high seas or international waters. But there just isn't anyone working on uh, artisanal fisheries. Most regional fisheries bodies don't have a mandate to tackle some of these issues with fisheries. And, and I guess you're talking about organizations and industrial fisheries, which are mostly owned by um, large companies that don't have to consider necessarily uh, protein needs and livelihoods of fishermen um, in terms of when they're trying to manage anything versus small scale fisheries, which as we've heard from um, the three presentations today, um, have a huge direct impact when we're talking about conservation um, to a lot of livelihoods and, and people around the world. So um, very different contexts in a way, but I personally think that we really need to be talking more about small scale fisheries and their impact on over a thousand species that can be considered uh, coastal species. Claire, would you, do you like to add something from your experience? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, my experience is probably not great to answer this question either because, you know, i um, sort of been lucky enough to work in Sri Lanka and India and I wouldn't, the sort of, the vessels that, you know, catch sharks there, um, whether targeted or, or bycatch, um, I don't know if we would consider them to be industrial vessels, but they are the biggest vessels that operate from, you know, those countries mostly and they are making you know, the majority of the landings of um, sharks. So it's not something that sort of, 
I've come across um, in my research. Um, and I think I would agree to a certain extent that there are, you know, still there's a substantial gaps in terms of data, understanding what's driving trade for, you know, artisanal smaller scale vessels. And there is a really big need to, um, to research those still as well. All right, so then we have a couple of related questions on um, thresholds, either minimum population levels or uh, um, quota obligations. Uh, so there's one from Mohammed Suleiman Hussein, which says, what is the minimum stock level of sharks in a country's territorial waters that would warrant focus on shark conservation rather than shark fishing? Uh, and then there's one from Robin who asks, uh, what can we do to help the EU and the destructive practice of quota obligations leading to massive bycatch discards? Yeah, I'm not sure, um, you know, is are these things, uh, you know, things that come into trade i mean if they are discarding them at sea probably not exactly uh, well it depends what they're discarding if they're discarding just the bodies retaining the fins or uh, discarding part of the body and retaining something else so it really depends on um, on the policies and and the practices in uh, in many of these fisheries um I don't know enough about EU quota obligations for many of these species, but I do know that there is high discards and I believe there was something um, about reducing some of these discards or at least uh, regulations to um, retain all of the bycatch. But again, it, it varies a lot by ocean basin with, again, the regional fisheries management organizations um, and yeah, I just don't know enough to be able to, to respond to this properly. Yeah, and would you say that there was some like threshold level of a particular species? I mean, do we have stock assessments to be able to say that? I mean, I doubt that in the majority of the world that we have such numbers. In most countries, we simply don't have stock assessments. Um, and, and this is, yeah, the, the unfortunate thing with, with sharks. And um, what is the minimum stock level? That's going to have to be species specific based on the biology of the species, based on the information that we have in each of the countries. And um, I think that conversation would be um, better had knowing what where what country this information, this question is coming from and what type of information is available there. All right. Uh, I think we have a bunch of other questions that are directed specifically at uh, Holly and Anna. And so what we will do is collate them uh, and discuss them on day four. Uh, so thank you so much for all of those questions. Um, perhaps uh, we can stay back for a few more minutes and have more questions to Claire. Uh, but uh, I would like to definitely thank Rima so much for you know, being here today and helping out with today's session. Uh, and of course, uh, supporting us all the way um, with respect to the Human Dimensions Working Group. Thank you, Divya. And yes, apologies, I have to, to get on another call. But thank you all for participating, for the questions, and all of the presenters for uh, putting this together, and particularly you, Divya, and, and Holly, for making this possible. So I look forward to, to listening to the rest of this online. Thank you, and goodbye. Thanks, Rima. Um, Claire, I think this is a question that's uh, straight up your alley. Uh, what is the best way to speak to fishers? How can we win their confidence and get real information? Uh, and this, uh, the person is from Brazil um, and, and says that he has a, a very similar problem to what we have in uh, our part of the world in South Asia uh, about you know, not having good enough data on landings. Uh, there's a lot of distrust with fishers. Uh, who feel like researchers are disturbing them. So how can we go about this kind of research? 
Yeah, I think that's never an easy, never an easy thing to do. And it's also, um, I guess the answer is going to depend massively on context. Because um, I think that uh, there's sort of two issues within that, because you've got sort of the distrust of fishers. So they really need to sort of, you know, believe that the research is is going to sort of have um, a positive impact and at least not a negative one, especially. So not identifying any sort of illegal behaviours or um, sort of helping to push conservation management measures, I guess. I think that's a lot of sort of the feelings now is that there's been a massive increase in regulations in such a short space of time. So it's just going to keep going for sharks, I guess. So I can sort of understand where a lot of that distrust comes from. And I think there's a sort of another issue in terms of like fatigue as well. Um, I think there's a need for a really coordinated approach sort of on a national and local level as well. So really ensuring that um, you're aware of who ha has done what, you know, in the landing sites before. So looking to work with people that have already been there, might already have relationships with fishers, because the worst thing is if, if people kept, keep getting asked lots of different questions about sharks and rays or lots of different techniques and very quickly we're going to lose the sort of um trust and the sort of interest of of um these stakeholders which wouldn't be good so i would say there's lots of different techniques out there so for example we ended up doing market surveys as we saw them as less sort of intrusive um because it was a way of sort of being there and, and getting data on landings and price and finding out a lot more about um, value chains, but we didn't need to have sort of long detailed discussions with um, sort of anyone. Um, it was sort of us getting the information um, and they were sort of minimally disturbed. So I would consider doing um, sort of that thing, but that does rely on having good relationships as well. Um, and that's what, yeah, that's what it's all about, I think is building trust and building relationships. Yeah, and I just want to add to that, uh, also asking uh, interesting questions that perhaps they haven't heard before. Uh, I know that around 10 years ago, uh, when I was doing uh, some research, just the fact that I asked them questions using a different technique, where I showed them images rather than just straight up asking something from um, a written piece of paper, I think that itself got their interest because uh, a lot of the fishers where I worked were not educated and so did not could not understand what was written. And so they, that kind of made them distrust even more. Uh, but once they saw the pictures and, you know, they could figure it out for themselves, they were a lot more interested uh, in, in the whole research. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, using various techniques like that might be a way to um, win some trust and get them to answer questions. Um, okay, so uh, I think we've sort of come to the end of today's session. Uh, I know that we have a lot more questions, and as I said, we will get to them uh, on day four. Um, but thank you all so much for being here, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow when we discuss a new topic, uh, which is local ecological knowledge. Uh, I especially want to thank our speakers for today. Uh, Claire Collins, Holly Booth, and uh, Anna Martins. Uh, I'm so glad uh, that you guys uh, gave us your time. And Claire, thank you so much for being here in virtual person. Um, but uh, anyway, thanks everyone for being here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And we will have uh, a more detailed discussion on this on day four. Bye-bye, everyone.